Good morning, friends, and thanks for joining me for another episode in our study in 1 Peter. We have just finished chapter 4 on Friday, and now we're diving into chapter 5. And in all honesty, this study is really drawing to a close quicker than I had thought. We've probably got a couple more devotions in 1 Peter chapter 5, and then we will have completed not our first, but our third book study here uh, since the pandemic started. We've been through Colossians, we have been through James, and now wrapping up here in 1 Peter. You know, W. Philip Keller once wrote that it's no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. And the behavior of sheep and human beings is similar in many ways. For instance, sheep do not just take care of themselves, as some might suppose. They require more than any class of livestock and endless attention and meticulous care. Now, the reason why that's true is because if you study sheep at all, and we understand the analogy as that's put in Scripture, it's more than just a cute little way of kind of relating us to our Heavenly Father. But anyone who knows sheep know that sheep get lost rather easily. And unlike most animals who kind of have an inherent sense of how to get home, they can become utterly lost and just continue to wander and wander, not knowing where they're at. Another thing about sheep is they can get very dirty. Their bodies secrete an oil that gets into that wool and which also attracts a lot of dirt and debris. And until that shepherd shears them or has a way to clean them, uh, they're, they get pretty dirty pretty quickly. Another thing is the sheep can't defend themselves. When confronted by an aggressor, they just run. That's all the defense mechanism they have. Uh, and so there needs to be something more powerful, stronger, standing in, in place for them to defend them. And sheep need constant guidance. This is one thing that I didn't realize about sheep, but if you were to leave sheep on their own, they would eat indiscriminately and even to the point where they would begin to eat things that are good for them and even things that are poisonous. They could even uh, decimate uh, the pasture that they live in if they're not made to go and find food in other places or to be led into places that have, as you know, it says in Psalm 23, by still, by quiet waters, which is what they need in order to get the kind of water that they need to drink. So it's more than just a cute analogy, and Peter's going to use that analogy this morning in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. And for these people that are in a Middle Eastern agrarian culture, they would understand and relate to this analogy very well, you know, again, as it's used numerous times in Scripture. But what's somewhat tricky with this passage is the task for myself to make sure that it relates to all of us. A cursory glance at this, pack, at this passage will show you that Peter is specifically talking to elders or pastors in local churches. Now, I want to make it clear, he's giving some very good sound directives to these people as they are overseeing people in the church. But I don't want the rest of us to miss the points that are in this passage. While these may be directed towards elders, towards shepherding pastors, there are still things for us who are the sheep, who are the laymen in church congregations, to glean out of this passage. So don't tune us out. Let's walk through the passage together. I want to try to show all of us that even though these elders are the main audience, there are things that we can learn. And my desire, as the goal of this devotion this morning is that we can see what elders and pastors should look like, how we can hold them accountable, but also to remind us of how we should be as God's people uh, under the people that God has placed over us. So let's look at the verses here. Verses 1 through 4 say, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. 
And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So, I exhort among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. This is the long preface statement to his directive toward these elders. That word so, very familiar, much like the word therefore we've seen before. Because of, he's glancing back, because of all this suffering we've talked about, enduring as believers, which I spent a couple of chapters talking through, meaning Peter, that those who are overseers in the church need to listen up. He is basically saying, I am speaking to you with the goal of compelling you to do these things. And Peter also qualifies his own authority by stating he is a fellow elder, meaning that he is, at a, he is a church leader himself, and he is seeking to raise up other godly leaders who will exalt Christ and make much of him in the local churches. And Peter's also a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He was with Christ at the Last Supper. He was with Christ at the betrayal in the garden, at his trial, at his crucifixion, and at his glorious resurrection. He saw him ascend into heaven and be at the Father's right hand forevermore. And Peter says to these people, Listen, I am a fellow leader with you. I'm one of you. And I've witnessed these things happen in Christ's life. And however, I am also a partaker with you in the glory that is going to be revealed. Here he is referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ, where we will all behold our Savior face to face and enjoy his physical presence among us forever. Listen, guys. We're all on the same team, as Peter's saying. I'm not trying to sound like someone who is above you, but rather I am a comrade in arms with you. So here are the things that we need to do. First part of verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So here's the command. Shepherd the flock of God. Now don't miss the significance in that small statement. Those who are placed as elders in the church, the pastors, must shepherd, meaning that they must exercise careful oversight and protection over whose flock? It's not mine. It's not yours. But it's God's flock. Peter immediately begins by pointing out that the stewardship for those who are pastors and elders in our churches must remember that what we do, our oversight in the church, should be an act of stewardship because the flock isn't ours. True, it is among us, later we see in verse 2. We are an integral part of it and it should be part of our life, but it is not ours. The flock belongs to God. And also, before you think that this term for a congregation is just a, a way of being condescending, the word flock here is really a sweet and endearing term. And it helps bring to mind how precious the people of God are to him. Now, again, you would catch on to that sooner being immersed in that kind of culture that that analogy comes from. But I want us to understand, being called the flock of God is a sweet and precious term for us. It shows the care that God has for us. These people, we are precious in the sight of Almighty God. And elders, the ones who exercise authority in the churches over these people, must make sure to show compassion love and care because they, again, they belong to God. But again, it's not just that. First, there's shepherd the flock of God that is among you. But now notice the second part of verse 2 and all through verse 3. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion. There's going to be A and B contrast here, positive and negative. Exercise oversight, positive, but don't do it under compulsion. Positive, but willingly, 
as God would have you, not for shameful gain, there's another negative, but then positive, but eagerly, not domineering, there's another negative, over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So now we're starting to see some of the details of how to exercise eldership in the church and what it should look like. So he gives us these positive and negatives to give the, the comprehensive viewpoint of what this entails. And for those of us who have an administrative function in the church, we need to understand that these are great guidelines, not only for us, but for congregations to hold us accountable, to make sure that those who are over them are following the Lord's commandments. This isn't the list of, here's all the rights you have, but listen, this is what you're called to do, and your church people need to know it too. We're not to be the be-all and end-all because we're human also. Listen, this isn't for us to be, uh, you know, the big man on campus, to be the most important person when there's a gathering of people. This is not just for us as leaders, but for church people in holding their leaders accountable. Friends, I don't know if you've thought about it from that perspective, but I hope you do now. That we as pastors are to exercise oversight, meaning we're to scope out our people. We're to take an assessment of who needs leading, who needs guiding, and who needs feeding. But there's a contrast in that statement. We must make sure to do it willingly. Peter says, as God would have you do, not under compulsion. And church people, you should be holding your leaders accountable to that. Now, what Peter is saying here by doing this willingly and under compulsion, it's really the difference between a, a want-to attitude in ministry and a have-to attitude. And let me just get this said from the get-go here. If you don't love the people that you're serving, especially the ones that are under your charge, get out of ministry. I'm not saying that to be rude. I'm not saying that to be curt. I'm just telling you, if God's called you to ministry, people are the ministry. We have to love the people. And Peter says, we're not supposed to be doing this so we can climb some kind of ladder or to create notoriety for ourselves. This isn't doing it for shameful gain, as he says in verse 2 and 3. We're supposed to be doing this because we love the people. Listen, this isn't about being someone's spiritual boss or some taskmaster. It's because we love God. And so as we love God, we love others. We should be doing this talking to leaders here, because we love God and in turn we love God's people. Our job, as Peter says in verse 3, is to set the example. And we're not going to be perfect at that. We are human. We are fallible. Congregations, hear me when I say that. We are human too. And Paul said, reminding, Paul reminded his people, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's the idea behind Peter's words here. Listen, as we live among our people, we as leaders should be interacting. We should not be appearing as someone who is aloof or who is only available for fulfilling a certain role that's on the platform. We should be in the trenches with them, preaching to myself here. We should be serving them and shepherding and leading well. And most importantly, we should be giving them a godly example to follow, an example that's worth following. What it doesn't mean is that we're going to be perfect. We are inevitably going to let some people down. But in our frailty, we should be continually pursuing Christ and helping to point others towards a pursuit of holiness throughout their lives. And Peter wraps up all this by saying in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. See, one day, Peter says, the chief shepherd is coming. The perfect example that we as leaders have to follow, we should be patterning our lives after. He is one day going to be in our very presence among us. We will see his glorious face. 
Along with that, we will receive our reward of faithfulness to him. In this closing verse of our time together, Peter says, it's a crown of glory. Now you see, historically back then, those who received a reward often would receive a crown. It's the equivalent of modern day trophies. Uh, crowns were quite popular as a way of showing that someone was being rewarded, especially in athletic events. And, and I, as I said, I think trophies have kind of taken over that in modern culture. But the point that Peter's trying to make here is as exciting as it may be to get rewarded on earth for something that we've accomplished, there is an even more exciting reward to come. It's not about having some cool bling to put on our heads, but rather Peter is excited about saying these things because he is excited about seeing Christ. He is excited about receiving the reward from Christ. That anything that is a reward from Christ is incomparable to something that this world would offer. It is a reward of eternal significance. Peter says it is unfading. That reward is never going to lose its beauty and it's never going to fade away. There is joy in this journey of shepherding the flock of God. Now, let me bring all of this to a point. I want to apply this equally for both those of us who are in the congregation and those of us who lead the congregation. We who are elders, who are pastors, must exercise our role with precision and care. Friends, we're called to protect, to feed, and to lead those under us. We must honor the Lord in how we care because, again, they're not our sheep. They belong to God. But let me briefly talk to those of you who are the sheep in this passage. Love your shepherds. Pray for your shepherds. Learn all that you can from them. Honor them as you honor Christ. And hold them accountable. Let them lead you as they chase after Christ themselves. Peter makes it clear how we as pastors should handle those in our charge. But equally so, may those of you who are being led help foster an environment that causes and encourages leaders to do their job not under compulsion, or in a domineering way, but rather, as Peter said, eagerly and willingly. Help them love what God has called them to do. You know, the analogy can only go so far, as every analogy has its limits. But let me close by saying this. May we hold the ropes for each other. And that is the writer in Hebrews 10 said that we would stir one another toward love and good works. May these be words that you meditate on and come back to throughout this week. Friends, thanks for joining me. And I look, more, I look forward to sharing more with you next time.